the problem that we had worked on earlier today was what's called the finite well problem, where we have a region of space where no potential exists. And outside of that space, you have a potential, um, some U naught, that exists infinitely in either direction. And we weren't really able to work out solutions necessarily to those things. We were able to work out what the wave functions ought to look like. And the only thing really what we had to do was, what, was to resolve the constants involved. And um, that requires doing boundary conditions. Math is very hard. So I just opted to sort of show what the energy states look like and the wave functions graphically and things like that. Uh, the problem that we're going to do, we're going to do a couple problems today. The first problem is sort of an inverse uh, potential well problem, what's called a potential barrier. And so this is just the opposite problem where in the space of zero to L, we have a potential that is some U naught. And outside of that area, there is no potential. So the idea is that the particle that we're going to describe with our wave functions can exist on the left side or the right side of the barrier. But um, as you saw in the previous example, there is a probability that could it could be found inside the barrier. And that's true in the case here. In fact, this concept is what we refer to as quantum tunneling. If, for example, we have our particle that is initially in a position that is to the left here, um, when it comes in contact with the wall, there's a potential for it to be in, uh, break through the barrier here, and depending on the thickness of this barrier, could potentially pass through the barrier and end up on the other side, even though it doesn't have enough energy seemingly to do that. We call this quantum tunneling. And uh, this is a strange idea. It does have experimental um, back into it. For example, um, in an experiment where, and this is similar to the Rutherford Gold experiment that we discussed that discovered the nature of the uh, nucleus of atoms, but shooting atoms towards a barrier, very, some kind of densely packed lattice, what you expect to see is you can shoot something uh, at that barrier and it will bounce off normally, right? Bounce off from some elastic collision. But it is possible that because of the probability functions of wave functions that there's a small percentage chance that when it collides, its position will be defined by something that lies beyond the barrier. And if that's the case, then it will pass through the barrier beyond the other side. This is the concept of quantum tunneling. And, it, and like I said, it has experimental merit to it. So we've seen this before. So let's look at how this happens. This is how the wave function will look in this situation. So we have this nice sinusoidal wave function, which is what we would expect for a free particle. So let's just not think about the barrier for a minute here. We have this wave function that is some sinusoidal function. But because of the barrier that's here and based on the thickness of the barrier, um, inside here we have a exponentially decreasing function. Again, just like we did for the finite well. Um, and it's possible that the barrier is short enough that when we get to the other side here, the exponential has not reached zero. So the probability is that the particle could be on the other side. And of course, if it does, then the particle is going to lose a significant amount of energy in the process of tunneling through there. But it can exist as a much smaller wave function beyond here. So now, that being said, we would have similar 
um, wave functions. Outside is going to be like a free particle. So we have Schrodinger's equation with u equals zero. We have nice sines and cosines to illustrate that. At the boundaries, um, we have to make sure that the wave functions match up. Inside here, where there is a potential, and we have that potential term in Schrodinger's equation, we, uh, we will uh, also have solutions that are exponentials. And of course, yeah, like in the uh, finite well, we have to match up boundary conditions at x equals zero and x equals L. Not a simple thing to do. Um, in fact, the mathematics behind this is very complicated to actually come up with the wave functions that work for this. But they do exist. We know what they are. And in this region here where we exponential decay, we can work out a probability distribution in here. We square the wave function. We integrate over zero to L. That's what the probability distribution is. And what comes out of this, and that's what we are going to be interested in for the purposes of this discussion, is the, prob the probability of tunneling. So when a particle comes in contact with either side of the wall, what is the likelihood that it could pass through that wall? And uh, when you work out the probability functions, uh, we end up with a statement like this. So I'm going to state what this is right here. So T is the probability to tunnel. And it's given by the following equation here. 16... E over U naught. Now, E is the energy that the particle possesses. U naught is the height of the potential barrier. That's going to be multiplied by 1 minus E over mu naught. And the idea here is that E is less than mu naught, right? That's true of this particle that's on the left here. It has an energy that is less than mu naught because you can see the wave function doesn't go as high as mu naught. So, um, it normally, from a classical standpoint, should reflect off. If it has a sufficient energy, obviously it can get through the barrier just fine. Uh, there's another piece to this, of course, and that's part of the exponential aspect to the wave function there. E to the minus 2, I'm going to call this a kappa L, where kappa in this case is given by uh, 2m Uh, u naught minus e. So that will be a positive quantity. Again, we're assuming here that e is less than mu naught. Um, and all of this is over h bar squared. By the way, this is still in the exponential here. So the expression is this 16e over u naught times 1 minus e over mu naught times e to the minus two kappa L, and kappa is this thing down here. And so that gives us what the probability is for a particle of a certain energy, given the potential uh, barrier value here, and the barrier uh, thickness, what's the probability that a particle would actually pass through there? So, a couple questions for you, and then we're going to work out some examples so you can see how that works out. But in this question here, we have a potential energy function here that is zero normally, but in the space of zero to 0.5 nanometers, the potential barrier is nine electron volts. So we want to complete the following sentence here. If the particle's energy is three, uh, and the particle is found in the middle here. What um, does class? What does classical or Newtonian mechanics say? What does quantum mechanics? Say? All right. I think a few people say in C. C is good. Newtonian mechanics says if you don't have enough energy for the barrier, you're not getting through the barrier. But quantum says that there is a probability that you can. And so quantum mechanics says, yeah, you could do this. Okay, so similar question here, basically the same question, except we're changing the energy of the particle to be 10 electron volts instead of three. 
So what's going to happen here? Hey, you bet. It is a... So if you have enough energy, if your energy is greater than the barrier, you can absolutely cover the barrier. Then you should think about this as the as following. Look, look, let's go back here and talk about this in a more practical way. Um, imagine that this is a ball that's rolling, right? Just rolling along and there's a hill, right? And so what happens is it has a certain amount of kinetic energy, right? And the kinetic energy can be compared to the potential energy at the top of the hill. Well, if you have enough kinetic energy to get up to the top of the hill, well, you're gonna get up to the top of the hill, which is what the situation is right here with the 10 EV. We have enough um, energy to get over the hill so we can get over the hill. Now, what's weird about this is that what about the situation where we don't have enough energy to go over the hill? We have the energy of, as three EV. So what Newtonian mechanics says is you're going to maybe roll up the hill, but you're going to come back down. Quantum mechanics says if you have some energy, it's possible that as you roll up the hill, you can simply appear on the other side of it. As, as crazy as that sounds, that is the nature of the wave function. It's not localized. It's spread out over a particular area here. And... Um, and so, as weird as it may be, to give a Newtonian mechanic equivalent statement would be to say that as you try to roll up the hill, if you don't have enough energy to get up the hill, you can just appear on the other side of the hill, which is cool, but weird, right? Okay, so let's look at some examples here. Okay, so here's our first example here. We have a proton with an initial kinetic energy of 50 EV and encounters a barrier of height 70 EV. Okay, so from a classical standpoint, this proton should not be able to, you know, when it encounters this barrier, it should not be able to overcome it. Quantum mechanics says, eh, otherwise. What is the width of the barrier if the probability of tunneling is 8 times 10 to the minus 3? That's pretty small, right? That would be less than a percent probability. How does this compare with the barrier width for an electron with the same tunneling energy through the barrier of the same height? So we're going to do the proton first. Um, so the tunnel equation is this right here. T equals G e to the minus 2 kappa L. And G is the coefficient, which is 16 e over u naught times. Okay, so I wrote the equation a little differently than how I originally presented it. Um, the coefficient in the front, I just called G. G is 16 e mu naught 1 minus e over mu naught. So I'm going to work that out first because we have the 50 and the 70 EV. So if I work out uh, that number, I get 3.27 for my value for G. Okay. I also need to work out what the value of K is for the proton. K is given as radical 2M U naught minus E over H bar. I just put, took the square root of the H bar here. And... Um, so I put all those numbers in and I get a 9.8 times 10 to the 11 inverse meters for that. Now, if I then take this equation here, I want to solve for the width of the barrier. I want to solve for L. So I'm going to put this in logarithmic form. So I divide by G here, take the natural log of both sides. Um, I get ln T over G equals minus... 2 kappa L with the minus there that allows me to flip the natural log. So I get G over T instead of T over G. And divide by 2 kappa, plug in all my numbers here. I get my 2. I get my value for kappa, which I got right here. I plug in G and T for that. And I get 3.1 picometers, pico being 10 to the minus 12. Very, 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 very small. Uh, the proton is pretty massive, to be honest, and that does affect, to a large extent, this kappa value here. It makes it much bigger. And being that it's much bigger, that's going to drive down the barrier width. So if this is the probability, a more massive particle is much harder to get through. And so if you want to have a probability that's basically a, I mean, this is basically a percent. 1%. We need a 3.1 picometer barrier. Very, 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 very small. The electron, on the other hand, has a much smaller mass. So its kappa value is uh, 
not quite as large and therefore the value for L can be bigger. And for the electron, um, I have a different kappa value. So that's, that's putting in the electron's mass here instead of the proton's mass. 2.3 times 10 to the, what looks like 10 here, yeah, 2.3 times 10 to the 10. And now we put all that in here and I get my barrier to be about a tenth of a nanometer now. So for an electron of this energy, which, you know, you could turn this into a, a speed here, right? Um, I don't know how, that's not, our, that's not a huge EV. So it's not a relativistic speed. You can convert that to joules and then you can convert that to a velocity. It's not a very big velocity. Usually you got to get into the mega electron volts before you start getting relativistic. But anyway, um, this non-relativistic electron here, you can work out what its speed is. And if it encounters a barrier of 0.13 nanometers, there's approximately 1% chance that it will tunnel through. So this next example here is uh, we have a two electron volt electron, encounters a barrier of five electron volts. What is the probability that it will tunnel through the barrier if the width is one nanometer or half a nanometer? Okay, so I got the same equation here. T equals G, E to the minus 2 kappa L. I'll work out my G, and I'm going to work out my kappa so I can get my probability. Um, I use 2 and 5 for my values for E and, and U naught. You don't have to convert them because they're ratios, so you can use whatever unit you want. But it's going to be 16 times 2 fifths. 16 times 2 fifths times 3 fifths. So I get a 3.8 out of this. And then the kappa value, i got to use the electron's mass here. Take the difference between these two. Now, here you do need to convert these E uh, because you're working with kilograms here. You're working with Planck's constant. So you got to make sure the units match up here. These are not ratios now. So you will need to put in what that is. The difference between these two is... Um, 3 EV, so 3 EV times the conversion to joules, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, gives us 8.9 times 10 to the minus 9. And so we have the value for G, we have the value for K. So I go ahead and put in my barrier lengths here. I have a nanometer first, so that's 3.8 E to the minus 2, kappas here times the barrier length. And we get a, a ridiculously small probability here. Um, I mean, this is basically one in a billion, basically, is the probability that this electron with such a small energy can tunnel through a one nanometer barrier. Um, basically one billion. Now, what's interesting, though, is that if we consider a barrier that's half as thick the probability goes up by almost 10,000. 10,000. And that's just the power of this exponential here because having that barrier length be different means the exponential is dramatically different. Okay. And uh, that results in a much higher probability. It's astonishing that it's so much, though. It's a huge amount. Uh, almost, yeah, like I said, almost a factor of 10,000 larger. So. That's kind of cool. All right. Let's get back to the lecture slides here. Where is that? That's here. I need to do this. I don't think I'm screen sharing the proper thing. I'm not because Zoom's ridiculous. All right. So let me show you a couple examples of where this uh, applies. Um, probably the most obvious example is what's called the electron uh, microscope, which is also sort of referred to as the scan and tunneling microscope, uses electron tunneling to create images of the surfaces of atoms. And so what you see here is you may have some kind of surface down here where the atoms are spaced out according to whatever lattice structure they have. And we have a probe that can have a potential difference, some potential difference between the the material here and whatever you establish in the probe. Now that potential difference is a barrier. It has some energy value to it. And so when you bring the probe very close, you can have tunnel in that takes place in the probe here. And that tunnel in probability is a function of the barrier length. 
So by bringing the probe close and testing uh, how frequently tunneling events occur, you can map out the surface um, of your material here with this probe. And it's all based on tunneling effects. Um, you know, regions where there's atoms, the surface electrons are closer to the probe, so there's a higher probability of tunneling. So when you get signals, you'll get more signals over the places where there's atoms, the spaces in between, not as much, and it creates a map, basically. And so um, lots of uses for this, obviously. One of the things is you can image lattice structures, but this can image things down to a nanometer or so. So it's a very high precision uh, instrument in that sense. Uh, the other aspect of tunneling that becomes very important is in nuclear physics in the process of uh, radioactive decay. So, for example, here, inside your nucleus, um, say this is a large nucleus, uh, you know, so radioactive element with potentially hundreds of protons and neutrons inside there, and one of the common decay particles that come out of, electro, uh, of, of, of nuclear decay is an alpha particle which is basically a helium nucleus, two protons, two neutrons. And that stuff is normally confined in the atom, uh, but there is a electric potential uh, that exists um, once you get out to a certain point. Now, normally the nucleus is held together by the strong nuclear force, and that's a whole other level of physics called uh, um, chromodynamics, which is all about strong nuclear force interactions. And, um, but if you get outside far enough away from the center of the nucleus, the strong interaction doesn't have as much of a hold as the electrostatic repulsion would. So when you get out to a certain distance, electrostatic repulsion becomes an important effect so this is also a potential barrier problem. And there is a probability that when in the nucleus, you can tunnel through the barrier and end up on the other side, which is ultimately how a lot of nuclear decay occurs, is something inside the nucleus is able to tunnel out. And while these probabilities may be very low, it's what ultimately defines the half-life of substances. So something like potassium-40, um, which is one of the more common radioactive elements of potassium, it can decay into an argon atom, right? Am I crazy about potassium-40? Potassium-40 can decay to argon, right? Yeah, it decays to argon. It decays via a positron though and the half-life of decay is a little over a billion years and what that tells us is that the probability to tunnel is extremely low very very low and it takes about a billion years for it to happen so I mean potassium is a large nucleus electrons are pretty small so I mean, what it is, ultimately, it's a proton that switches to um, it switches to a neutron, and it creates an argon atom in the process. So, But it's a very common radioactive decay. In fact, uh, it's all around you right now. In the seat you're sitting in, in the walls of your house. But it's not... It's such a rare thing that it's not doesn't have any significant radioactive um, consequences to us. All right, so let's move on to the second example we have for today. In fact, let's see here. I know it's early to take a break. However, this lecture is broken up into two sections. One is tunneling and one is um, the harmonic oscillator. So let's um, we're going to try to tackle 
a, another kind of potential energy problem in quantum mechanics. And this one um, is called the harmonic oscillator. This is um, this is basically the example of like a block on a spring, right? So if you remember back in physics 110, we did a really basic um, um, oscillatory problem involving blocks on a spring. So we have Hooke's law. I'll write a little bit up right here. So Hooke's law, which governs forces of springs, Hooke's law says that the force of the spring is given by minus kx. k is the spring constant, and x is the displacement from equilibrium. And if you look at how we calculate work in this situation, the potential energy function we get, which is the spring potential energy function, is given as 1 half kx squared. And so the graph that you see here is sort of our classical interpretation of what this is like. We have a total energy in our system. And as the block oscillates back and forth, we have an energy transformation from kinetic to potential. And so when we get to the center at the equilibrium position, we get the highest speed. And then as it gets to either ends, um, it's converted to potential energy. So when we get to minus A position, which A is the amplitude, it's all potential energy and the same thing on the other side. So um, what also sort of governed this was that the angular frequency of this motion was given by radical k over m. And that applied classically, but that should apply um, as well to the situation here, um, that these are related. Now, the energy ultimately of the particle in any moment here is given by one half mv squared plus one half kx squared. That's a mixture of kinetic and potential energy. And we can take this also at, at its extreme. So at the ends, this turns into one half ka squared. Um, when you're at the furthest ends, there's no more kinetic energy. Now, what we expect to happen in quantum mechanics, well, there's something that should still apply. The value for omega should still apply. That's, there's nothing about that that seems like it should be different. K is spring constant. It's, it's not the wave number, okay? It's spring constant, M's the mass. So that should be the same. We do expect our energies to be different, though, because as you can see in our energy expression here, classically, you can have any energy you want. You could have, you could pull out the spring to any amplitude you want to, and give it any kinetic energy you want, and that's how the system works. Here, we know that our energy is going to be quantized, so we expect our energy to sort of look like, you know, E something along the lines of H bar omega. And that was from the very, well, you saw that in the beginning of the last lecture. Um, for particles that behave as waves, uh, the momentum, or the kinetic energy really, um, was given by h bar squared k squared over 2m. That's a way to express the energy, but um, you can also express it with h omega. So we expect that 
the energy is going to be some multiples of that. But we'll see in a minute here. So let's actually do this. I'm going to transfer to a whiteboard here. We have a lot to write about. So give me a minute to do all of that work. Okay. So Schrodinger's equation here would look like the following. I don't want to pull, zoom. Um, minus, uh-oh, got to tell it I want, yeah, okay. So here we got minus h bar over 2m. We have the derivative of the wave function, second derivative, of course, with respect to x. Um, the next term is our potential energy fu uh, function, which is 1 half kx squared times the wave function. And that equals the energy times the wave function. That is the one-dimensional Schrodinger equation that is time independent, um, which all I did here is just substitute into this uh, what the potential energy is. Let's rearrange this to look a little nicer. I'm going to isolate my second derivative here and move everything over to the other side. If I do that, then I'm going to get a 2m over h bar squared. I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by the reciprocal of this and the negative sign as well. But when I incorporate the negative sign here, I get the 1 half kx squared minus e. And so it's going to look like this. So as you can see here, we have our second derivative of the wave function times all of this garbage here times um, the wave function here. Now, this is obviously a differential equation. I mean, if you look back up here, look, this is a differential equation. Um, just replace the derivatives here, this derivative with y, if you want to say that. So we got y double prime, for those taking differential equations, plus x y equals a constant y. Well, this is not a simple differential equation. And at the level that we are at, we do not have the tools to solve this equation. However, solutions do exist, and let me give you them. There are multiple solutions to this equation. And the solutions are what is known as Hermite functions, which involve Hermite polynomials. So we do not have the tools to solve this equation, but I will simply present you the solutions to them because they are solvable, just not with techniques that we no. So, now I said there's multiple versions of this. The lowest energy state is given by the following function. A naught is a constant. E to the minus alpha squared x squared over 2, where alpha squared is given by m omega h bar. The second one is a very similar expression. It involves an a1 x to the e alpha squared x squared over 2. There's a second one. I'm not going to go through all of these. This is a2. 1 minus 2 alpha squared x squared e to the minus alpha squared x over 2. And you can keep going. But each wave function corresponds to different energy states. The first wave function is an energy state, is the lowest energy state of that. So we're going to have to go through a very painstaking process here to verify 
that that wave function does work. And from this, we can work out what the energy of that is. That way. So we're going to work on this first function here. A naught e to the minus alpha x squared over 2. And that should correspond to the wave function of a particle in the lowest energy state of the harmonic oscillator. And, uh, but we need to verify that it works with this equation here. So the way we're going to do that is this. I got to take my wave function. I got to take the second derivative of it and then compare it to the right hand side, which is me simply taking this function and multiplying by all the stuff in the front here. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Let me clear this out and let's work on that derivation. So again, the wave function looks like this. A naught e to the minus alpha squared x squared over 2. Alpha again is equal to m omega over h bar. So let's take derivative number 1. I don't like how low that is. Let me move that. Delete. Go back to the draw. Okay. So uh, let's take derivative number one. That's pretty easy, right? A naught e to the minus alpha squared x squared over two. And then uh, we use our, what's that called? Chain rule. Chain rule? No? no, I think so. Minus two alpha squared x over two. That simplifies to what? Uh, alpha squared x e to the minus alpha squared x squared over two. All right, that's a, that's a two. That's our first derivative. Not too bad. Oh, there's a negative in the front. Let me make sure I have that. Is it? The twos cancel out. The alpha squared's in the front. The x is there. Um, uh, sorry, I missed one thing here. There's a squared on this alpha up here. All right, so that's not too bad. The second derivative is not going to be the most fun thing in the world. Let's just get through that, though. So we got to take the derivative of this expression right here. And we're going to do this in parts. This is chain rule again. Product rule. Product rule. I don't remember all these names for the things here. Product rule, I guess. So, product rule is going to be nice because this comes in two parts, right? Uh, there's x and then there's the exponential. Well, if we take the first part of it, we just take the derivative of x, which is just the rest of it, right? So, that's great. And then the second part of this is minus a naught alpha squared x e to the minus alpha squared x squared over two. And then we take the der we took the derivative of the exponential, which returns the same thing. And then it has this junk in the front here, or on the back, which is what we did before. The twos drop out. And if I clean all this up, not pretty. Uh, what would we get here? Oh, we get an A naught. We get a plus here because there's two negatives. We get an alpha to the fourth power now. Um, what else we get? We get an X squared. All right, that's it. Woo, not too bad. It's pretty bad, actually. All right, now we're going to put everything together. So this represents the left side. And I will painstakingly rewrite this, unfortunately. I'm going to shuffle some things around, though. I'm going to move the first term to the front here, though. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to rewrite this, but I'm going to move the first term, the second term, sorry, to be the first term. So that's going to look like the following here. A naught. Oh, my goodness. Zoom. So finicky. All right, it's on. All right, uh, a naught alpha to the fourth x squared e to the minus alpha squared x squared over two. Um, 
I'm gonna make sure I don't confuse this stuff here. Man. Try this again. Okay, I gotta give myself more space. Clearly. This is not the this is not the whiteboards I'm used to. This is not a lot of room. Alright, so let's rearrange things here. A naught alpha to the fourth x squared e to the minus alpha squared x squared over two minus a naught alpha squared uh, e to the minus alpha squared x squared over two. And then that's got to equal the other side of Schrodinger's equation, which is uh, 2m h naught squared uh, 1 minus kx squared minus e times the wave function, which is a naught e to the minus alpha squared x squared over 2. Now, a lot of things cancel here. So this is the second derivative on the left side here. On the right side is the other side of Schrodinger's equation. We can do a lot of things here. The a naughts drop out. There's an a naught in every single term here. The exponential drops out because it exists in every term. So let's rewrite what we have left over here. This is alpha to the fourth x squared minus what's left here? Just a lonely alpha squared, poor thing. All lonesome. I'm trying to personify quantum mechanics here for you. All right, there's life out there, thank goodness. All right, uh, now what's going on over here? Well, I have all this stuff out here is gone, so let's go ahead and distribute the rest of it. Oh, brother. Come on, Zoom. You keep telling me I don't have my thing up, but I do. Equals. Oof, let's, let's distribute all this. Uh, the twos drop out. Here we get an mkx squared over h bar squared. And then the other part is a minus 2me over h bar squared. Now, um, so you'll notice that uh, the first terms match up because they both have x squareds in them. And the second terms match up because they don't have any x's in them. So I'm going to match up both sides, first of all. So I'll do that over here. So term one looks like alpha to the fourth equals m k over h bar squared. And the second term looks like alpha squared equals two m e over h bar squared. Now I'm running out of space here. So I'm gonna jump, unfortunately, to another whiteboard. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite that stuff here. Um, match up the terminology, the terms, not terminology, the terms. First attempt at the alpha failed. Let's try that again. All right. Okay, so alpha squared uh, 2me over h bar squared, and the other one was what? It was uh, alpha to the fourth, right? Um, m k over h bar squared. Well, if I solve for e here, remember alpha squared equals m omega over h bar. So um, if I solve for e here, I get alpha squared, h bar squared, over 2m, which then corresponds to m squared. Oh, no, not m squared, just m. Okay, so m omega 
h bar squared over h bar 2m. The m's drop out, a factor of h bar drops out, and we get, oh, look at this, 1 half omega h bar. Really? Not squared, though. That's not squared. I already canceled out a factor. And then this thing needs to go. All right. Um, I can draw that. So we get a one half, one factor of h bar and an omega. Well, look at that. Because we thought that our energy should be h bar omega because that's what the energy of these particles are. It turns out to one half. Fantastic. What about the other side here? Well, we get a uh, m squared omega squared over h bar squared equals m k over h bar squared. The h bar squares drop out. A factor of m drops out. We're left with omega squared equals k over m, which means omega is a radical k over m, which, by the way, is what it is classically. So I know this was pretty insane calculation. Trying to verify this works with the Schrodinger equation. But it does reveal for us what the lowest energy is and the fact that omega is still abided by yeah, classically as, uh, as well as quantum mechanically. So this is good. This is good. Let's go back to the slide, though. So, yes, it's true. The energies are multiples of h bar over omega. Now... I'm not going to go through the process of the second wave function or the third wave function because they're even more complicated. That was the simplest example I could do of this. The second wave function has an X in the front and then the next one has like a binomial in it with an X. So those are even more complicated to do. But you start to see a pattern. And the pattern is uh, this relationship right here that the energy levels in here follow these half integers where the first one is one half h bar omega if then n equals one for a quantum number this is three halves h bar omega we do two it's five halves and so on so that corresponds to what the energies are here and so here's what we see that unlike classical where you could have any kind of energy you want, meaning any kind of separation, any kind of speed. These are quantized and they're given by these half integers, one half, three halves, five halves, and so on. Now, this is actually fine because, you know, what is h bar times omega? I mean, h bar is insanely small. It's something times 10 to the minus 34. So on a quantum level, when you deal with very small energies, things are clearly quantized. When you get to the microscopic level, you know what the value of, of N is? The value of N is probably something insane, like 10 to the 30. So the quantum number for something like a block that moves back and forth, they have a quantum number that's not 1 or 5 or 7 and has a quantum number that's 10 to the 30. And so on the macroscopic level, it's not clear that the energy is quantized, but it clearly is. The lowest energy state being the 1 half um, h bar omega here. Okay, we're not totally done. There's one more thing I got to do with this, though. So bring up that whiteboard again. I'm going to clear all this stuff out. Because our wave function was this. Our wave function was, okay, the lowest energy state wave function. Uh, A naught e to the minus alpha squared x squared over 2. Again, alpha squared being m omega over h bar. The last thing we need to do is normalize this. Because we need to figure out what H, what, sorry, this A naught is here. 
And the normalization condition is the following. I'll just erase that. Okay, scribble it out. Here is the following condition on this. That the integral over all space of this wave function squared, that is what the probability distribution is. So if I plug that in, I get the following here. a naught squared, e to the minus alpha squared, x squared. Now, exponentials are always positive, and there's no exponential, there's no imaginary numbers in here, so I don't have to worry about conjugates. So I have to keep the absolute value in the a naught, though. Uh, this is dx equals 1. Well, the a naught is a constant. I'll take that out of the integral. And we're left with this. Now, this integral here, it's a tricky integral, involves, uh, what does it involve? How do you do the integral? You got to do, what is it? Oh, you got, you know what you got to do for this integral? You got to, you got to change, this is crazy. I'm not, I'm going to briefly talk about this, but this is wild. You actually have to square both sides of this equation, and then you've got to convert the integral into polar coordinates. When you convert to polar coordinates, you can do a u substitution to uh, figure out the value of it. Of course, we're in physics, and anytime we have to do an integral that's complicated, we don't actually do our integral. Yeah, yeah, no, what you do is you multiply, you square this. But when you square it, you do a substitution where instead of x, you use y. So you get a y squared plus x squared plus y squared here. Then you convert the polar coordinates, which then changes to an r squared. And then your dx dy, which you'll have here because you doubled it, turns into a, what, what is it, is a, 2r dr, and then it becomes a u sub. Anyway, I'm not going to go through the details because you don't necessarily have to do any of that stuff. But I will simply tell you, or Wolfram Alpha will tell you, that the value of this integral is interesting, though. Radical pi over a. And so if we solve for a naught here, you put in the value for a, which is up here. So it would be a radical. And what we get out of this when you do that substitution, again, A, not A, alpha. What am I putting at A here? It's alpha. So I gotta put a little extra tail on the top of this. Okay, so you plug in the substituting for alpha here. Uh, you gotta take square root of this, obviously. And we get that A naught is the fourth root of m omega h bar over pi. And that means the complete wave function, which I'll write up here, is the following. Fourth root I'll leave it as an alpha though, even though we know what alpha squared is. That's the complete wave function. And that's only for the first energy state of a harmonic oscillator. So again, how do you establish harmonic oscillator? You have a mass, uh, you have a barrier width or something like an amplitude, and the very first energy state is described by this wave function right here. Okay, so let's look at some examples of that. What are you doing there with that? Okay, that's good. So here is the wave function. This is the upper left here is the wave function that we just worked out. Um, the exponential has a nice sort of bell-like curve to it. And um, the values for a, minus a, and positive a uh, dictate the boundaries of the harmonic oscillator. But of course, 
um, because of the probability function, it can exist, there's a probability it can exist outside of that. If we go to the second wave function, that was pretty much the same thing except it had an X in the front. And with an X in the front, well, the left side gets inverted because it can be negative, so it looks like this. Um, I showed you the second one it involved uh, a binomial, a quadratic binomial in the front, and that's this equation here. You can keep going with this. But these are what the wave functions are going to look like for these. And um, I'll come back to the example in a minute here. But these are the probability distributions. So we take those wave functions and we square them. And when we square them, what we see is that the minimum probability is actually in the middle. So I know the, the, the light green is the wave function, but this blue here represents the, prob the probability distribution which is always minimum in the middle. And then it increases as you get to either sides. Now, what's the interpretation of that? Well, the interpretation of that is like the classical one. Imagine the block that slides back and forth. Where is the greatest speed? In the middle. So it spends the least amount of time in the middle. When it gets to the ends, the speed is the slowest. So it spends more times on the ends, which is the prediction from a quantum mechanical standpoint. The ends have a greater probability to exist, greater probability, um, which does match pretty well with the classical interpretation of things here. So that's kind of neat. Anyway, let's go back and let's do this uh, example here. This is just plugging in numbers to the stuff. So we have a sodium atom, which has a mass of 3.28 times 10 to the minus 26, uh, vibrates within a crystal, so it's like a harmonic oscillator in that sense. Just the, the sodium atom is going to oscillate back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, the potential energy increases by 0 0.0075 EV when the atom is displaced by 0 0.04 nanometers from its equilibrium position. Okay, so this is an increase in energy based on a distance movement here. Okay. So we want to figure out the following. What's the angular frequency of core of the classical mechanics? Let's do that one first. So the potential energy function is given by 1 half kx squared. So um, now we can solve for k here. k is a function of the angular frequency. Angular frequency being radical k over m. So plug in what k is here. We get 2 u uh, over mx squared. Um, the value for u is going to be given by this value up here. We got to convert that to joules, so 0 0.0075 EV times the conversion to joules, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. We have our mass, the sodium that's down here, and we have the distance, which is 0 0.014 nanometers, so it's going to be 1.4 times 10 to the minus 11. And we work all this out and we get an omega value of 1.93 times 10 to the 13 radians per second. Very, very high. Very, very high. What is the space of energy levels according to quantum mechanics? Well, that doesn't really require much of work. We know that each one is separated by an H bar omega, right? It goes one half, three halves, five halves. So the energy space in is H bar omega here. Plug in our values for H bar. Uh, the omega that we just worked out here, uh, divide that to convert it to EV. Um, what's going on here? These values look different. Hold on. Hold on. Where's my calculator? Why are these values different? Give me a second here. Something looks silly. Okay, divided by three. Uh, minus 26 divided by 0.4 e to the minus 11 squared. Take the square root of that. 1.93, okay, that's right. But why do I have a different value here? I don't know why I have that. It's, tr it's not do the different value. Oh, brother, minus 34. Okay, divided by 1.6. Well, okay, so I just, I guess I just, 
wrote this incorrectly. This is not, sorry, I just, in my slide, I wrote it incorrectly. This is not 1.79, it's 1.93. It's the same number here, it's this number. I don't know why in my slide I wrote it differently. It doesn't make sense. Anyway, this is the correct energy though. That's the energy space and not a lot of energy space in here. It's pretty small actually. What's the wavelength of a photon of transition? Well, this is the energy spacing. Um, boy, everything is very odd here. I also have a different value down here. I don't know what's going on in my slides here, in my examples. This is not right. I mean, let's double check this one too. 4.1 to the minus 15, yeah, times speed of light divided by this energy. Okay, I am clearly out of my mind here. This is, this value down here is just not right. It's this value here. So it's the point zero one two seven. This is correct here. And this is correct. This, the numbers I wrote down to plug in are just not right. I don't know what I was thinking here, but 97 micrometers, that is some kind of ultraviolet uh, photon here, but that would allow the transition. It's not a lot of energy. So we do expect a somewhat low energy photon. Infrared's pretty low energy here. All right, looks good. Let's see what else we got here. I don't know if there's much else to say here. Um, a diatomic atom is a good representation of the harmonic oscillator because you have these two atoms and they're bonded together by some kind of molecular bond. But what can happen with that molecular bond is it can oscillate. So molecular bonds between atoms act like a spring to a large extent. And there's a lot more things that go into it though, but if you model the atom in a diatomic molecule as a harmonic oscillator, uh, we get a very good approximation for what that behavior is like. So um, this graph here is sort of illustrating the approximation we have, which is basically a parabola parabola and um, the u here is the function that we get that actually dictates what's going on with this and so when you're close to the actual location of these atoms the approximation models really quickly if you get very far enough away you break free I mean this is what if an atom gets dissociated then we don't have a harmonic oscillator anymore so on this end it makes sense that things don't match up. Um, but in the region where you're looking at the separation between the atoms, very good approximation. This is the other things that are involved though. It's the thing is that, you know, what are the relative masses of these things? Is it, is it truly diatomic? Meaning like an oxygen and an oxygen? What if it was like a carbon and an oxygen? That's a little bit different. There's also uh, vibrational energy, not, not vibrational, but there's like, um, rotational energies involved, they have to take that into account as well. So that's why it's just an approximation. All right, I think that takes us to the end here. I'm not, I wasn't gonna talk about this aspect here. And then I'm not gonna work out this example here. I, I put it in the slides, but this is basically what I just did earlier, but I'm doing it for the next wave function. And the next wave function involves an extra factor of X in here, which makes your derivatives even funner, if I could use that word, than they are before. But it's a lot of extra work. And honestly, it would take me, it would take me over half an hour to do all this work here. And it's not totally irrelevant. I mean, it's the example that we've done with the first state is the same stuff here. Um, so I'm not going to go through this example. It's just going to take so much time and I don't think there's a lot of value in it. So the focus here 
is the solution to the harmonic oscillator. I and mean, we did two things. We did the tunneling. So you do want to remember the relationship for that, which I had written up right. Where's the tunneling relationship? Well, it's given in the examples here. And then we have the harmonic oscillator, which uh, we have functions for, and you can verify those and work out normalization constant.